Okay, so thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to speak here. Uh, I was already in, uh, at, the, at the Bates meeting two days ago, and there uh, I found that about half of the audience hadn't uh, done Scala before, so I, so I had to derail my plan and essentially give an intro to Scala and only got back to the some of the juicy a bit towards the end. So I promised all of these guys to say, well, if you want to know more about what's co really going on, going on for Scala 2.10 and so on, come here. So here. I won't let myself be derailed. We go right in the middle of things. Apology to the newbies who haven't seen Scala before. There's only a couple of slides for you. Afterwards, we sort of talk about what's new, uh, what's the delta from what we have to what we will have in a couple of months from now. So today, uh, Scala is uh, doing pretty well. Uh, here's just a non-exhaustive uh, list of companies using it. Uh, Manish, you mentioned uh, the PHP meeting, so one of the uh, Guys here, Foursquare actually migrated from PHP to Scala some years back. Uh, I don't. I hope they didn't regret it. Uh, <laughs> no, not really. And uh, there, there are lots and lots of others. So what we see typically, where it's mainly used, is uh, web platforms like LinkedIn, Foursquare, Twitter. Uh, then also a lot in financial services, in particular trading platforms, financial modeling, simulation, and. It's really lots of odd things, lots of other areas as well. And the, the <coughs> advantage that most people see in Scala is that it's very fast to first product because it's uh, pretty, pretty agile. You can use it like a scripting language. It can be very productive. And it's scalable afterwards. So you won't typically run out of steam as you would run if you were writing PHP or Ruby or things like that. It's a, it's a language with a fairly good performance story. So some. Uh, Statistics here, if you see where are we in the grand thing of things, so that's just came out from, I think, uh, data is that uh, uh, some, some analysts. Uh, so they, here you see on that uh, line, that's the number of Stack Overflow questions, and that one is the number of GitHub projects. And you see Scala is not yet a mainstream language, that would be the upper triangle, but it's sort of ahead, uh, just in front of the pack of second tier languages. And hopefully, over time, we can sort of shift this thing a little bit more towards the upper right. Here's another graph. That's the number of job ads, uh, indeed.com. So it's a job ad aggregator for all jobs in the US. So there you see it was basically flat and noise, and then it jerked up. That was when Twitter announced that they were actually using Scala in their stack uh, at that point, and then uh, there's a, a further acceleration. That's when we announced that there was a company uh, supporting supporting the, the technology. So in all these measures, we're doing pretty well, and uh, that's actually very encouraging because essentially for me, the modern times are not that uh, that that old yet. So. Uh, Scala 2.8 came out 17 months ago, Paul told me uh, the other week, and I was totally uh, surprised because for me everything before 2.8 is really prehistoric, the dark ages. So, so that the, 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 the modern age of Scala is actually pretty young, 17 months, and I must say that anybody who really went deeply into it before, like, like Twitter did, uh, it was very courageous, and I, I'm really glad they did because that was really created the, the, the crit critical mass. But for the late Comers who got into in 2.8 or later, it's so much easier. So 2.8, the, the main, uh, the main uh, new thing in 2.8 were new collections, collections which then essentially a lot of people like a lot. Uh, then there were also some language things that we added, like package objects. Uh, so a package can now contain fields and, uh, and uh, methods and types and things like that. And then some smaller ones like context bounds and better implicit resolution. Uh, so, so that, that was 17, 17 months ago, and for me, that's sort of the start of modern Scala. 2.9 came out in May, and that added parallel collections. So you can now, uh, with the same operations that you use for normal collections, you can run these things in parallel. It had a delayed init and a, essentially a revamped uh, application um, object. It had a faster repo, and I think in that time frame, we were finally seeing some progress in IDEs. So IntelliJ uh, was, I think, uh, for a long time ahead. So they, they were improving quicker than the others. 
uh, Eclipse was really lagging behind. Uh, we made that our job from the company side to change that. We poured now, I think, overall four time, uh, three full-time employees and two part-timers, one of them myself, into the Eclipse project to really come up with a, with a good, professional, solid IDE. That's been our first uh, priority from when we started the company. And I think we're close to, finally, uh, close to being there. I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened in, in Eclipse later. Uh, we have more recently done something on the doc side. There's a community doc, uh, doc site that uh, a lot of people have contributed and done really good work. And I think that's also very, very important because before the docs were, were lacking. And lots and lots of bug fixes. So that was Scala 2.9. And uh, in uh, the, the, the main edition of 2.9, like I said, were parallel collections. Uh, so parallel collections, maybe I give you uh, if you're a newbie, then nevertheless a quick intro of what they are, uh, just that you see what they are. So that's not uh, Scala, that's Java, right? So somebody can tell me what that thing does. Probably I showed that. What does that thing do? Well, it's OK. You don't need to know Java. It's Java. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So that, um, that sorts uh, an array of people partitions into an array of minors and an array of adults. I was a bit mean to, to specify arrays, so you had to use these in intermediate data structures array lists because, well, arrays, you have to know the size beforehand, so it's tough. OK, so that's on the bottom here. You see the same thing in Scala. So you say people is an array of person, and then you say minors and adults is people partition according to whether their age is less than 18. So I think it's pretty obvious which one is shorter, and also pretty obvious, obvious which one is clearer. So obviously, this one is much closer to what you want to achieve, whereas this one exposes all the details how you go about doing that. OK, and that, this, that line here, I, th I think James Irie, you work, I think he, I got it from you. Uh, so so you, he, James was the first one who pr brought up this wonderful example. Because in a single line that already shows some of the key concepts of functional programming, which of course is a, a key ingredient in Scala. So what you have on the left is a simple pattern match. That partition thing uh, returns a pair of arrays. And using pattern matching, we can deconstruct the pair and name the parts of the pair. We, we say, well, the first one is minus, the second one is adults. Uh, partition is actually a method call on the people array. Uh, in Scala, every infix operator is a method call on its left, usually. Uh, and you might say, well, why uh, do arrays have partition method? What's that data structure? And I should say to you, this array of person is exactly the same as the Java array. So we do that with what we call implicits. Uh, so implicit wrappers can actually inject new methods and also new interfaces into old types. And that's very useful for these, uh, for these uh, situations. And the final one is we have a function value. That's this underscore h less than 18. Uh, that's the function value, the criterion that we pass to partition so that it can do its job. OK, you might say, good, so that's a quick intro to collections. What about parallel? Uh, in Java, I don't think I want to try. Uh, it's uh, obviously too much work to parallelize this partition thing. At least it wouldn't fit on a slide, and we would lose a lot of time doing that. It's possible, but it's work. Uh, so in Scala, what you can do is uh, the only new thing is dot par here. So that's a parallel collection. People dot par, so dot par con uh, converts any collection into a parallel collection. And that means that afterwards, all the operations on that collections are executed in parallel, where it makes sense. So taking the first element, of course, you can't do that in parallel. But partition, you can do very well in parallel. So that's an operation that will be done in parallel here. So that's uh, a, an obvious win. Uh, uh, last week, for instance, uh, Graham Thackley 
from The Guardian told Julian, who visited him, that uh, Guardian is a, a big newspaper, I think second largest after New York Times in terms of web views. And they wanted to do a quick um, uh, real-time statistics, how many people clicked on what pages. So I threw together a quick app in an afternoon uh, using collections. It was all very fine, but it was a bit sluggish. And then I said, well, let's try to make them parallel, throw in a couple parts, and lo and behold, it ran much faster. It ran fast enough. So it's not always like that. I'm not saying we have invented the silver bullet for parallelism. Uh, I thought that would be... Uh, uh, you wouldn't believe me anyway uh, if I told you that. But it's, there are a lot of situations where it is like that. So it's a good, good thing to try, in particular because collections are just so good anyway that you want to program with collections even if the parallelism story doesn't actually hold in your thing. And if you do that, then, well, if sometimes, or quite, a, quite often, they actually do parallelize nicely, then uh, that's an obvious win, of course. Okay, so... Going to uh, the types, uh, the types are actually pretty challenging uh, of this whole thing. And uh, that's sort of uh, the two faces of Scala. So on the one hand, it's a beauty to use. So the user sees that, right? On the other hand, uh, if you look at how it's implemented, uh, in what are the layers, then it can be pretty frightening. So the layers, uh, some parts of the layers are that thing here that we say, well, this array uh, or, or something like an array is a sequence, and that uh, is a special case of an iterable, and that's a special case of a traversable. And then we have here the dot par takes us from here to here. So we have the parallel sequence and the parallel iterable over here. But then we have to say, well, uh, there should be cases where I want to get a collection, and it, I don't care whether it's parallel or sequential. I just want it to do its job like a map or a filter or, or, um, or, or a partition. And in that case, I uh, have these other types which says, well, it could be a sequential collection or a parallel collection. They're called gen sequel, sequence gen iterable, and gen traversable. You might ask, well, why didn't we just make par iterable a subtype of iterable? And the answer is, well, that actually would break existing code because when I interact with an iterable now and I do a for each, let's say, I know that the thing would go from left to right sequentially. So if I throw a par iterable in there, then that assurance doesn't, doesn't hold any longer because the thing will be done in parallel. That means I might observe any order, in, 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 including interleaved order. So we can't do that. Uh, so in order not to break existing code, we had to put in this new hierarchy. And logically, we should have named that sequence and iterable and traversable and then that sequential sequence and so on. But since those names were taken, that's the names we invented. Now, one thing we actually think of, we, 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 I, I take that very seriously, that we say, well, there are good reasons we have to do all that, but it's still a lot of types. I mean, let's face it, it's a lot of types that hang together and integrate things. So one thing we are considering for 2.10 is actually to merge the traversable and iterable layers, because they, 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 they don't differ that much. So a traversable is a thing that has a for each method, so you can essentially uh, go through it with a, with a function, either sequentially or in bulk. Uh, whereas an iterable gives you an iterator. Uh, iterables are somewhat more general because essentially you can, for instance, go through two collections in lockstep, like when you do a zip or a compare. With a for each, you can't do that. For each is only one collection. Uh, but uh, we might be able to actually merge that better, and that would remove about 20% of the superclasses of something like list, which might be worth it. Okay, so the next step afterwards, so if you, uh, is uh, to say, well, Parallel collections, they're great. What about uh, going to distribute it? So uh, big data, tens of thousands of servers or something like that. Can we extend the same things there? And actually, that's been done uh, several times. And every time, the result is extremely impressive. So I've seen it. Uh, Scala days are talked by Josh Zureth on Cascade, which has nothing to do with cascading in this whole area. People reinvent the same names all the time. So Cascade is essentially a collect Scala collections front end over Google MapReduce, uh, or rather Flume Java. So Flume Java sits on top of MapReduce and does some uh, optimizations by fusing several uh, MapReduce steps. Uh, Flume Java is quite impressive software, but it suffers from the problem that it's, it's, it's rather a pain to program. So you have to essentially describe every step with a class, and that's really bulky to wire these things up. Whereas uh, 
with parallel collections, what you do is precise something like that. Only now it works over the internet with the things. So that's really, really very nice. And Josh Zurith and Daniel Mara did that for that for MapReduce. The Spark work well, that will be presented is actually quite similar. So that's another thing that goes in that in that context. And also there's been uh, something done by Twitter and Cloudera called Scrunch, uh, which is essentially the same thing now on, on top of Hadoop. So all this thing is pretty exciting because it takes a lot of the tedium out of the problem with the big data. So I think that's the next logical step to do that. Okay, so I've talked about 2.9 parallel collections, where are we gonna take them? Uh, what happened now, essentially in the post 2.9 era, where I think uh, three big things, uh, the Eclipse IDE, the Play Web Framework 2.0, which got just announced in beta, Akka 2.0, which is close to being in, uh, being in the first uh, beta release, and then finally Scala 2.10. So I'm going to talk about each of them a little bit. Um, so the Scala Eclipse IDE is uh, very, very close to final. It's now in RC2. Um, it, would be in, it would be in final now if it hadn't been for Spring. Spring released a new version uh, last week which turned out to be incompatible in the weaving with uh, what our plugin did. So it turned out that if you installed Scala on top of, uh, of Spring, that worked fine. If you installed uh, Spring on top of Scala, it would fry your Eclipse and you'd have to essentially go back and, and install a new Eclipse. So bad, bad luck. <laughs> so, so we couldn't release it that way. We had to fix that problem first. And once that's fixed, it will be, it will be in final. Okay, so the goals for that version of the IDE were uh, primarily it should be reliable, no crashes, no freezes. It should be responsive, so never wait when you type. And it should work with large projects and files. So our own uh, benchmark here is the Scala compiler. It's a bit more than 80,000 lines of code. Uh, some files have 5,000 lines of code, so uh, you should be able to edit those things and uh, with, without waiting and uh, getting all the services like hyperlinking and completion. Okay, uh, the Scala compiler is also an excellent example of advanced use of the type system with lots of the path-dependent types, self-types, mixins, the whole thing. So the feature set is, to attain these goals, the feature set was intentionally rather small. So we wanted to do the highlighting uh, completions, including completions with implicit. So that means if you have an int, then all the stuff that you get in a, in a rich int that's added is visible. Or if you have an array, the partition method should be visible, even though in a Java array, of course, it isn't. Uh, hyperlinking and uh, good project builds uh, based on SPT here. Um, and then the other big uh, uh, feature that we had to do was good support for mixed Java Scala projects, uh, which I believe we have now. So all features should work between Java and Scala sources. Then JUnit test running. Uh, and then the other things we will get to now that this is released, but so far we have gotten some contributions from external libraries, so essentially the first step to get something, some limited refactoring, a code formatter that actually works pretty well, mark occurrences, uh, structured selections, and show inferred semicolons. The next big step beyond that, once we push that out, will be to, 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 to work on the debugger. So right now the debugger is a Java debugger. It's good enough, but sometimes it's annoying because uh, it just doesn't understand uh, uh, Java uh, Scala stack traces that well and things like that. That will be the next step afterwards. Okay, uh, so initial uh, tweets were quite encouraging. So for instance, Yoni Freeman, the author of uh, uh, Lift JSON said, Latest Scala Eclipse plugin works surprisingly well, even manage, manages our mixed Java Scala project. Or here, uh, the latest beta of the Eclipse plugin is much better. I'm starting to like it. After years of misery, the Eclipse startup plugin actually seems to work quite well. So uh, you see that, yeah, obviously there's some improvement. Uh, so that's all, <laughs> that's all I, I, I think we can't, we can't argue about that. Good. Uh, so the architecture of the Eclipse plugin is um, quite interesting because I believe it's actually the only one that uses the standard compiler as the interface for, for doing all these things. All the other uh, IDEs I know have a sort of a special compiler, like uh, the, the JDT compiler and things like that. It's not the same as Java C. 
Uh, also, for instance, IntelliJ have their own compiler to do completion and, and error, error highlighting, not the standard Scala C. So we use the full uh, Scala compiler for everything, for error highlighting, completion, hyperlinking, and things like that. And uh, the other thing we had to do is wave into the JDT compiler where it needs help because to do the interop with Java, essentially the Scala IDE, the Scala plugin, needs to masquerade as a sub-perspective of the Java perspective. So essentially we need to go into the, the JDT, otherwise we couldn't have joint projects. And that was in times hard. Oh, that's also the reason for the holdup with the final version, because the JDT was not meant to be extended. There were patch requests for years now to the JDT team to say, well, please publish this extension point. Everybody knew what they were, and they all got denied because they said, we do not want to use the JDT for other languages except Java. So if you want to do that, you're on your own. We won't support that. OK, why rely on the Scala compiler? Well, the main reason was reuse. So writing a type checker is hard. Uh, I think one to two person years is optimistic. Uh, it's probably more than that. Uh, to be consistent, uh, so if you have two compilers, they might disagree, and one might flag an error where the other finds, finds this thing OK. That's very annoying. And uh, also because uh, quite a lot of compiler plugins have already been written for Scala. And uh, if we use the same compiler in the IDE, that means they all work in the IDE, which is, of course, a big advantage. So why m might you not rely on Scala C? Well, I guess the first reason is speed. Scala C is not uh, a million lines per second compiler. It's more like a thousand lines a second. And that's if you have a 5,000 line uh, uh, file that you want to recompile on every keystroke. That's simply not fast enough. So you have to uh, uh, do some clever tricks to make it to, to make that disappear. And also, there's a very tight dependency that way on the Scala version. So 2.8, 2.9, 2.10, each one of them has a different compiler. And the Eclipse plugin has to work with all of them, which was quite an, uh, a constant engineering problem to make that work. But I think it's overall, it's, it, it's the right choice to do that. So at the heart of the IDE is then the presentation compiler, which is a very intricate piece of software. The standard compiler is already a very intricate piece of software. And now we say, well, the standard compiler now has to work asynchronously, has to be interruptible at every point. We have to be able to do targeted type checking. That means uh, type check only some part of the thing, not, not, not the other parts of a file. And we have to be able to have it stop and give us a partial result after arriving at a certain point with type checking. So a lot of new demands to the presentation compiler. Uh, the way it's done is that the presentation compiler sits on its own thread, and here are the other Eclipse threads, and there's a work queue. Uh, so for instance, you, the Eclipse thread might ask, uh, say, might tell the presentation compiler, well, I want to know the type at a certain position, for instance, in order to do afterwards a completion. So that, that means to find out all the members of the type and all the members uh, uh, added by implicits that are then uh, presented to, to the user. So when you do control space, you want to see the types. OK, so the presentation compiler then would pick up the ask type at and would go to work. Uh, it would uh, go through, uh, through the, through the uh, type tree and find um, the uh, and find the, uh, the the type at a given node. Now it could be that the type. Well, so what the presentation compiler does when nobody asks it anything, it will be busy and rec and compile all the all the modules that it has loaded, all the files that are currently open in editing buffers. The presentation compiler tries all the time to re recompile those. If the user types a single keystroke, it has to throw away everything and start from scratch because that keystroke could potentially change all the dependencies. So. So that's what it does. And when somebody asks then a the thing, it will interrupt what it does. So on every node, when it type checks, it listens. Is somebody wanting something from me? And when it gets interrupted, it tries to do that thing. So if that's, for instance, an ask type at, it will say, well, do I happen to have the node where, where we are uh, at, at this position? Does it already have a type? If that's OK, if, if it has a type, it can immediately return that. If it doesn't have a type, then it goes into targeted type check mode, which says, well, I start at the root of this file, and I type check essentially only on the path of the root to this node. I don't go into left or right subtrees. I go from the root of the thing to that node where somebody needed the type. 
Uh, and that's possible, uh, fortunately, because the compiler's design essentially embraces laziness everywhere, very systematically. So everything uh, I, where I need the types, I first create a symbol, like a symbol for a field or a method or things like that. And its type is a lazy, computed value. That means only if somebody needs the type, it will start the computation, and the computation would then look at the subtree and maybe do type inference, local type inference, and produce the type. But if nobody needs the type, it can just leave these things alone. So that means going on the path to this node and finding the type at this node will just force the minimal set of recompilation that we need. So in that sense, the architecture of the Scala compiler actually made this job of incremental type checking much, much easier. OK, and then once it got the type, type at the result, it's uh, communicated through a sync var, uh, and then it goes to the next thing. So that's basically how it works. So all compiler activity happens on the PC thread. Uh, when the queue is empty, we compile the loaded files. Uh, and uh, the uh, work queue is checked when the type checker reaches safe points in the AST. So typically, it's done type checking a node. And we'll say, that's a safe point. I can pick that up about 1,000 times a second. Uh, more than that, uh, a million times a second. And it, it drops everything when a file is changed. OK. so. Uh, the implementation was uh, uh, posed some interesting challenges. So by that architecture, it means that now, uh, because the type checker is restarted every time somebody presses a key, so you can literally have hundreds of type checks, uh, type check runs per minute. And that means the tiniest memory leak you have goes up very, very quickly. Uh, because uh, if you have so many, you, you, you leave a couple of bytes behind after a compiler run. Uh, with that, hundreds of types uh, runs per minute that could, can grow very quickly. Uh, the, the other problems were side effect state and this uh, targeted type checking. And the next part of it was the, so we needed to improve the compiler to do that. The initial part of the presentation compiler indeed did have memory leaks that we had to fix for, for, for the thing. And that means we had to actually backport things to older versions. So the Eclipse plugin now works with 2.9.1, with 2.10, uh, but also with 2.8. And there we had new versions of 2.8. So the, the latest official version of 2.8 was 2.8.1. And now we had a 2.8.2 and now a 2.8.3 that essentially contain only these improvements that are needed for the presentation compiler. OK, so that was the Eclipse thing. Uh, the other new thing is Play, so Manish already mentioned that it's used here. It's a cool web framework. Uh, it's uh, very much inspired by Ruby on Rails. It's the same convention over configuration, rapid deployment web framework, automatic. So essentially what it does, it, it contains actually a hot compiler in the Play framework. So you can save your Scala file and we will pick it up. It will on the fly recompile it and integrate it into the running thing. So no build step, no recompile step. It's almost like, it, it looks like it's an interpreted language where you load this thing directly. Um, so originally Play was a Java web framework with a Scala module. And it's now migrating to a Scala base. Uh, uh, that will have two APIs, a Scala API and a Java API that will both be first class APIs for the framework. It's going to be in integrated in the next version of the TypeSafe stack. And TypeSafe will contribute to the development and provide also commercial support and maintenance. So it's a very, very, very nice framework. And we're very glad to have it in the stack. Also runs great on Heroku. Uh, the roadmap of what we want to do then, uh, so the initial TypeSafe stack that came out in May, that bundled Scala 2.9 and Akka 1.1. Uh, uh, we had a point release in October that bundled the 2.9.1, essentially the, the greatly improved 2.9 series with Akka 1.2. Uh, the next big step will be uh, come out in the first quarter next year. That will still be the 2.9 series of Scala, but then Akka 2.0, which will be a big step ahead. For lack of time, I can't really talk about that in the talk, but if you ask me afterwards, I can tell you what it is. And also the Play Framework second version. And then we're looking uh, about six months later at a version which will have Scala 2.10 and uh, then the, the current releases of Akka Play and also a database connect layer that we are, uh, are working on. Uh, 
Uh, Scala 2.10 will probably come out immediately after this, probably also in the first quarter of 2012, but we didn't want to roll it in the, in, into the stack because we didn't want to force people to upgrade the language to get essentially the new libraries. So the order will be new libraries and then immediately afterwards a new version of the language which will then be in, in, the, in, the, in the next version of the stack say, six months later. Okay, so now we come to Scala 2.10. So what's in Scala 2.10 or what we have now? So I think the biggest step ahead is the new reflection framework. That's sort of on the same order of Scala collections to say, well, it's, well, no, it's, no, Scala collections replaced what was there before. The reflection framework replaces a void. So there was no Scala reflection and now there is. And that, that's a big, a big step forward. Uh, there's been, it, it will be integrated with something we call reification. Uh, the type dynamic, that's uh, something useful to be able to interact with uh, JavaScript and dynamic languages and uh, reflection also. More IDE improvements, so we plan to have find references, debugger, worksheet, faster builds, we're working on that. And then there's some Scala improvement proposals for string in in interpolation and simpler implicits, which look like they will be accepted. Uh, we have Scala improvement proposal, we have uh, restarted a process to, uh, where the community can discuss and propose things to improve Scala. I think there are currently four of the new ones out there. Uh, so that's a bit modeled after the Python PEP process, Python enhancement process. So essentially open discussion and then a jury will decide what, 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 what goes in. And I have the last word. Okay, so one of the things that will be new in Scala 2.10 is the type dynamic. So here you see roughly uh, what that is. So dynamic is just a market, market trait, so nothing more than that. And you can then have classes or traits that extend it. And those classes or traits that extend it have to implement a method called apply dynamic, which is not the same as invoke dynamic. Uh, you can implement it with invoke dynamic if you choose, but you can implement it in other ways as well. So apply dynamic takes a method name and the arguments uh, of the varags with any, and this one here doesn't do anything except print uh, what, what it gets. Uh, but here's the usage scenario where you say, okay, I create a new object, new JS, and I call now x.foo of one. So of course that thing doesn't have a foo method, uh, but it will still uh, type check and it will just translate into apply dynamic of the foo method and then the added arguments. And with the bar field, it's the same thing. So that means that uh, we have essentially a gradual sh transition from static to dynamic and reverse. We, if we want to have objects that uh, we don't want to type check beforehand, be it that they come from JavaScript, what you see here, or a lot of things, let's say, from, from database wrappers. We don't have a schema. We don't know what's in a row. Just call the type dynamic, and you essentially then you just delegate the, the responsibility to the runtime to do the right thing with that. A pretty simple addition, which I think is, will, will solve a lot of pretty hard problems. Uh, the second proposal for 2.10 is uh, string interpolation. Uh, I was sort of against string interpolation for a long, long time because I always said, well, this one is not that much longer than that one. But I have to admit, having, after having written about 10,000 strings with the pluses in between, that it, that it <laughs> It does get tedious and it is not very legible. So finally, uh, we have an idea how we can get string interpolation, but actually much, much more than string interpolation in one, one tiny package. And that was sort of, for, for me, the bang for the buck factor was then high enough to say, well, OK, let's do it. So what we do here is that we would have a string where just, well, the dollar thing gets interpolated. But of course, Doing that directly we can't do because, well, strings have a meaning in Java and Scala and the dollar is just a printable character, so you can't do that. So what we do instead is with the syntax we write here an S. So the S means essentially uh, Scala standard string, uh, but the S could be something else. So there could be something, an arbitrary sequence of characters. Here it's an S. Uh, so what that gets translated to by the spec is that the compiler will say, well, I create a new string context where I put all the bits that are not interpolated here as a var arc. So Bob is years old. And then I call essentially my processing method here. It's called S. So S will be a method on the string context. And that then gets the argument that fits uh, 
in here. So that gets the end. And what the method then would do is it would create a string buffer. It would put that in the string buffer. It would put that converted to a string into the string buffer. And finally, that, and it would return the string. OK? So that's how interpolation works. And it's geared towards uh, the, the fact that this s can be pretty arbitrary. So here, I told you what it does. But uh, if you had another method name in here, then it would translate to the same thing, only with the other method name. And then the other method name could do other things. And some of these things are quite interesting. So one thing we could do is uh, we could have an alternate XML parser. So we write XML and then a bunch of things in quotes. And that thing would start an XML parser that would actually give us the tree that corresponds to XML. Uh, that tree needn't return the same representation as the current XML literals. For instance, it could return uh, a, an anti-XML uh, representation, what Daniel Spivak has done. So that means we decouple, actually, XML from the actual library. And who knows if that's successful, then maybe at some point in the future, Scala won't have XML literals anymore, because that will be a very good replacement for it. Would, would have to be a deprecation process and things like that. But I, I would personally be very much in favor, because I try to tell all, the, all people, look, uh, Scala is actually a pretty regular and orthogonal and simple and small language. And they say, yeah, but what about XML? And I said, yeah, except for XML. <laughs> so if we can get rid of that, then I have a strong argument for, for that thing. So I'm all in favor. Uh, the other thing we could do is actually then even have a hook up a Scala parser with that thing and actually have code that inter interpolated Scala code that a Scala parser would read that would create a Scala tree and that would a add as the, these, these things into the tree. So that would open up the whole world of macros, quasi-quotation, and things like that. And you could think of many, many other things. Regex expressions is a third one that you could, could imagine. So the, 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 the simple change has, has, has a lot of very powerful potential. OK, uh, so that was the one SIP. Uh, the next SIP is, so the, everybody likes that. So the string control, uh, we went through a couple of versions. The final version, it's basically, it's pretty clear that it will be accepted because everybody loves it. Uh, the second one is not at all clear whether it will be accepted, uh, accepted because it's very, very controversial. So uh, some things why I, push, why I put it out here is to get some feedback of you, what you think of that. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the thing is, uh, so I've written a lot of Scala code, of course, and uh, it's gotten easier over the time. So essentially, my fingers type it automatically, except for one thing. Uh, when I type if, I always forget the open parent. Always. So I, my fingers don't want, want to, to write, write the condition, not the open, open parenthesis. Why is that? Because in Scala, actually, there are two other um, usages of the keyword if in a for expression as a filter and in a guard, in a pattern match, where I don't need the parenthesis. And that's just not very regular. So can we like go and have a, an alternate syntax that lets you write the ifs uh, without the parenthesis? Then, of course, you need a then to separate the condition from the body, so something like that. And while we're at it, of course, we should do the same thing with the while, where we would the do have the do in the body. And for the for expression, it would be the same thing. A do, no parents needed here. Or a yield, the yield we already have. So for me, that's an overall cleaner design, uh, less notation, less, less, less noise uh, in the thing. On the other hand, some people told me, look, uh, uh, it's not standard, and uh, you don't change the language anymore. And now there's another convention. People will write it with parents or with that, and things like that. And I accept that also, of course. So it's not at all a done deal whether, whether this will, will, will go in or not. Maybe after the, after the talk, I, I'd be interested to hear your opinion on, on those sides. OK, the third one is, again, something with, that I believe is a clear win, and that's uh, implicit classes. Uh, so I said the partition method gets added to arrays with an implicit. Uh, here there's another, uh, here you see another class uh, that adds the min method, so minimum, to the, to the int type. So you can write 1 min 2 or x min y. This gives you the minimum of x and y. And the way it's done is it's a, the min method is a member of a class rich int. 
And the origin takes an int as a parameter, and it's an order. It extends an int. It implements an interface, and it implements the min method. And uh, that's the uh, situation right now. So you have the class here, and then you have an implicit wrapper method, um, which we also call rich int here, that will create this class, uh, this, cla this, this, this wrapper class when it's called. And by, by the fact that it's implicit, it means it will be inserted by the compiler whenever uh, somebody calls min on an int. Uh, the problem is that's a bit cumbersome to write. And we said, well, that's OK. People tend to abuse implicits anyway. If we make that a little bit harder, no, no big deal. But on the other hand, uh, it, it would be much nicer if we did it that way. So let's just add an implicit to a class. And that way, we get the wrapper for free. So basically, uh, uh, generated behind the scenes. And that means we get a lot closer to the simplicity of extension methods. Because people always say, well, yeah, but these implicits are so hard. Extension methods in .NET are much nicer. And I have to say, yeah, yeah sure, they're shorter. Uh, implicits can do more, of course. They can implement new interfaces like this ordered. You will never be able to do that with an extension method. But there was a price to pay. So OK, with the implicit class, we get the syntactic noise down. Then you might have the other objection to say, yeah, but you still create these wrapper objects. Well, we can keep our fingers crossed and hope that the VM will optimize them away, but it doesn't always. It, it usually does an OK job, but not a, not a perfect job doing that. So the next uh, thing that I, you, you don't see on the slide is that we want to give you an, a possibility to write inline in front of the implicit. So we, we'll let you. Um, have classes that can be inlined, inline classes. So what that means is that if you then invoke a class with new class name and then immediately call a method and the class is declared implicit, uh, the compiler will not generate an instance of the class. It will immediately call the method. There are some conditions to make that work. The, me uh, the method must be final, so the compiler will know what method to call. The class must not have state. The class um, must, uh, what was the third condition? Not, no side effects during creation. But these are all things that one can check, that, that the compiler can check, and it can uh, flag the inline as an error. And if we do that, then implicit uh, wrappers would have exactly the same efficiency as extension methods. So that, that's a big win, I think. OK, so that's the next thing. And the last part, which is actually the biggest chunk uh, and I'm going to talk the rest of my talk about that is reflection. So previously, there was no reflection in Scala, so you needed to use Java reflection. Um, and that meant that there was no runtime info available on Scala's type. People were incredibly inventive to actually recover that runtime info anyway. So they were looking at the, uh, at the Java signatures that we generate to actually uh, uh, do interop with Java, and those can be recovered by Java reflection. You can look at the attribute, you can parse that. And uh, then they were sort of concluding back, well, if the Java generated signature is that, then probably the Scala type is that. Uh, the problem was that sometimes that was wrong, and it was brittle, and it wasn't, wasn't, it wasn't perfectly accurate anyway. So what, we, what you can do now is you can, uh, for instance, get um, um, a, a class from uh, a Scala class class object from 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 a string like Java class for name. You can also get the type of an object. So what we do is actually we have a mirror-based design because that's sort of a more general design than than the, the than the Java design. So there's a mirror, a standard mirror, a Scala reflect mirror that you can ask to get the type of an object. And uh, you can then use the type to do other things. For instance, you, you can say, well, the super type with the, with, the, with the given class of that object, what's that type? So for instance, if your type is, is, uh, is uh, string, uh, well, no, uh, some car, well, int list, the list, list int list, then we'll, we'll, we'll say, well, what's the super type of traversable? We'll say, well, that's traversable of int, something like that. Uh, you can get all the members of a type. Uh, you can get named members. Uh, you can get then from for each member its type uh, using the type sig method. You can ask, for instance, whether the, whether that type is a subtype of another type. So essentially, you have the full power of Scala types in reflection. It looks pretty reasonable, no? Okay, so that's actually pretty hard. 
So to, to show you how hard it is, let me show you what Java does. So that's the interface type in Java. And if you look at the Java doc, we find that it's actually empty. There are no methods on types. But nothing you can do with a type. If you look at the, then the particular types, uh, subtypes like generic array type, parameterized type, type variable, uh, class, then you find that uh, those methods only tell you what they are, like a parameterized ty type will tell you, well, what's it, its parameter, but there's still no methods, like what are the members of the type uh, and, and those things. So the only essentially full kit that you have is on the level of classes. So that was pre-generic Java. Java 1.4 actually has full reflection support. You can, for instance, ask what are the members of a class. Is a class a subclass of, a cla of another class? But for types, nothing. And it's not the same thing. For instance, uh, list of int is not a subtype of list of string, right? Or traversable of string. So the question of whether type is a subtype of another is a very interesting question. And there is no way to answer that in Java. So want to know whether an arbitrary type A conforms to B in Java? Answer is write your own Java compiler. That's the only way you can do that. So why? Why the oversight? Why, didn't, why wasn't that done? Well, it actually turns out that in order to do that, you need to write the essential parts of a compiler. That's what a compiler does, decide whether type A is a subtype of type B. And if you do that, then you will need to ensure that your reflection compiler and standard Java C compiler agree. And that's, over time, it's almost impossible. I mean, uh, you have bug fixes, you have things in the compiler goes forward, then everything has to be backported to the reflection framework. Imagine the nightmare. So it hasn't been done. OK, so how can we do better? Um, the problem, then, is to manage the dependencies between compiler and reflection. So we said, OK, parts of a compiler will have to be embedded in our reflection framework, but other parts not. And the reflection framework will add new parts. So we have a partial overlap. So before I show you how to do that, it's maybe time to refresh a little bit the state of dependency injection in, in Scala. Uh, so let's see what we do then. So dependency injection means we want to avoid hard dependencies to specific classes so that we can rewire them. In our reflection framework, that will have to be rewired to either the compiler or the runtime reflection. And uh, instead of calling specific classes with new, which is a hard reference, we want to have somebody else do the wiring. So that's dependency injection. Uh, there are frameworks for dependency injection. The most common ones are Juice and Spring. So here's a Juice example. So uh, here's a simple example of essentially a coffee pot uh, thing. So we have some service interfaces, an on-off on device, a sensor device, a warmer, and a client. And then we have the implementations. So there's a, there, there's a heater here, which is an on-off device. There's a pot sensor, which is a sensor. And then there's a warmer which contains the uh, pot sensor and the heater. And it has a trigger method which says, well, if the sensor tells me coffee is present, then heater on, else heater off. And uh, there, there's a client object that takes a warmer and, and triggers the warmer. And the problem then is uh, that to actually wire that up to say, well, essentially, I need to know I need to get supplied the actual warmer in the system. I don't want to do it uh, statically with a new. Uh, I have to do some configuration. So here we, we have some binders which says, well, the on-off device here is the heater. The sensor device is the pot, pot sensor. The I warmer is the warmer, and the client is my client. And then we have these service injectors. And lo and behold, my, finally, we can just start this thing. So that's dependency injection with Juice, which of course works for, for Scala as it works for Java. And it's pretty standard. But it's also, yeah, I mean, show that. If you show it to a newbie, then I think there's a lot of incantations. You have to do it this way. You shouldn't, you shouldn't understand that, right? You, you, you won't need to understand the basics how it's done. You just say you do it like that. That's, that's OK. OK, in Scala, it's actually. Uh, well, in Scala, you can do that, but you can also do another thing, uh, uh, namely use uh, the cake pattern. So here we have the same service interfaces. Here we have the implementation, heater, pot sensor, warmer component. 
And then in the client, uh, we have uh, the, uh, the subcomponents as vals, and we trigger it. And the advantage of having it with vals is that we can freely override that. So we can override uh, values in, in, the, in the base class here. You would do a new client, and you would override the on-off value with a new mock heater and the sensor with a new mock sensor for testing, and it would just work. So over, being able to override fields gets you already part of the way. And here you have the same fields on the right. So that's a sort of intermediate thing. Uh, in, that, in this new model, components are classes or traits. Uh, requirements are abstract values. So the warmer component here would say, OK, I need an on-off device, but I don't want to specify which one. So I just have a, a val here, which says, well, when somebody who will implement me will have to supply that device. But for the moment, I will leave it open. And the sensor is a sensor device. So requirements are abstract values. And wiring is done by implementing those values. And the wiring can be changed by just overriding these values. So it's our altogether, I guess, a pretty simple model. Uh, but it uh, doesn't really work just like the constructor injection doesn't work for cyclic dependencies. This doesn't work for cyclic dependencies either. So what do we do about that? Uh, for Instead of constructor in, uh, injection in juice, you would have field injection, set injection, so that would work. Uh, but uh, that's altogether uh, a different thing. Uh, I don't want to go too much into that. For Scala, what we have is the so-called cake pattern. So what is the cake pattern? So we start with the same service interfaces. Uh, the service implementations now say uh, we have a heater component. And the heater component relies on the fact that it needs to be part of an assembly. So that's done with this self-type in the top where we say this colon assembly. And uh, then the heater component has nested a class heater, which is the same thing as, it, as we had before. Um, for the sensor component, I do the same thing. The sensor component uh, requires that it's part of an assembly and it contains a class sensor. And finally, for the warmer component, we have that here. So components are traits. The wiring is done by mix-in composition. We say that our trait assembly is a warmer component and a sensor component and a heater component all together. And the requirements, then, they are the type of this. So what, what do I mean by that? So here we see. Um, uh, let's see, where do we have some? For instance, in the sensor component, we have a heater dot off. So where did the heater come from? It's not declared in sensor component. Uh, well, when we write heater dot off, what it means is really this dot heater dot off, right? And the type of this in sensor component is not sensor component, what, what it would usually be, but it's a type that we indicate here. So it says the type of this in the sensor component is an assembly. And we go to assembly and say, aha, there we have a heater component. And the heater component has, a, has the heater. So that's how the heater got from the heater component into the sensor component. It could be used in the sensor component, but defined in the heater component simply by saying, OK, these things are mixed together here. And here, we, in a sense, we require already that <coughs> sensor component must be part of something that's at, at least as good as assembly. So that's the idea of self-types that we have in in Scala, and it's again, it's something that is, in principle, it's very, very simple. So what the classical rule is always that the type of this is the type of the enclosing class. Or, and that's actually, if you think of it, there's no good reason why it should be. Uh, the type of this could be anything, and here we just declare what it is. You just have to make sure that when you have a con concrete class or you create an object, that then the concrete class has the same idea of what its self-type is, what the type of this is, and all components, uh, the, what, what the components want agrees with that. So the, the situation is really very analogous to abstract methods in 
object-oriented languages. An abstract method doesn't have an implementation. But the compiler doesn't scream and says, well, you can't write this class. It has a method you, you haven't implemented. You say, that's OK. By the time you create an object of this class, the compiler will check that you will have implemented this method. Self-types, it's the same thing. The type of this is something richer than the component. That's OK. By the time you create an object, the compiler will check that the two types agree. That's, that's all there is to it, really. And it's been something that we started, actually, when we modeled object-oriented programming, theoretical computer science. We, we tried to model that. And it sort of fell out as something that was slightly more elegant in our models. So we said, well, we do it in the models, but in the language, we don't need to do that. And uh, then we, somebody told me, well, no, no, you should be honest. What you have in the model should be in the language. I said, OK, put it in the language uh, as well. Probably not much use, usage. And now we found out, well, this thing actually gives you dependency injection. So it's a big deal. So it's a very nice story how that, how that made it from sort of saying the model becomes more elegant, but I believe the code as well. OK, why is it called the cake pattern? Well, it's called the cake pattern because you see the cake has slices and layers. So these things, they are the layers. So there's the outer layer, there's the inner layer, the warmer class and the warmer component traits. And the slices are essentially the warmer, the sensor, the heater. So you can essentially layer things and slice things and then combine it all into a cake. OK. Uh, the cake pattern is used in a lot of uh, Scala code. I believe, for instance, Foursquare's whole system uses the cake pattern almost everywhere. So does the Scala compiler. So here's a very, very abbreviated thing what the Scala compiler does. So a big part of the compiler is dealing with types. And another big part is dealing with symbols. So symbols represent de definitions, declarations like fields and uh, methods and classes and things like that. And they're two large parts, so you don't want to merge them into a single one. And they both need to know about each other. So the types, when you have a type, you have, for instance, a method type is a particular type that has parameters which are symbols. And a symbol, of course, has a type. So the, the, we have references on the, type, on the type level now from one to the other, not just on the field level, on the type level. And then we say a symbol table has the symbols part and the types part. It extends those two. In reality, there are not two slices of the cake like here, but about 20 uh, uh, of that, that are the different aspects of things like that. OK, so that's the compiler, and it uses the cake pattern. So how can we make use of that for reflection? Uh, the first thing is they are very close. Both need to decide different, the, same, the same questions. Is a type a subtype of another? What are the members of a type, and so on? But then again, they're also quite different. So for instance, if there's an error, the compiler would probably show that nicely on the console or in the IDE. Whereas if there's an error in re reflection, what can it do? There is no console. It has to throw an exception. Uh, a compiler will access a lot of files when it, when, it, uh, when it compiles. In reflection, you don't have a class path. So you can't actually go out and read files or things like that. You have to do it all essentially with the loaded classes and their annotations. And so on. So it's a couple of differences, but we are close enough that it makes sense to combine these two things. So what we do is we uh, try to work with several cakes. So we say we have one cake, which is reflect internal universe, which is essentially all the internal parts of reflections that contain symbols and types and what the members are and things like that. And then we have NSC. NSC is the, the standard uh, Scala compiler. Stood at some point for new Scala compiler. Now it's no longer new for a long time already. So NSC global, that's the root of the Scala compiler. That would be a subtype of that. It would add more stuff to that and change some specific things like error reporting to go to the console. And then there's another uh, thing, reflect runtime mirror, which is the actual mirror in reflection that uh, also is a subtype of reflect internal universe. So each of these is a cake of many traits and classes. And here we have two refinements on the left and on the right. So that works well. But there's a problem with that, that here, uh, this thing here 
it simply exposes way too much detail because essentially for the compiler to compiler needs a lot of access to symbols and types, a lot of very, very sophisticated, very subtle methods. No way we're going to guarantee that these are stable from one version of the next. Nobody would have the, 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 yeah, the stamina to document all these things in a way that's expected from a, from a public facing interface. So we can't do that. That would be co totally confusing. I mean, these, these things have way, way too many methods. So we want to abstract things. Uh, also, there's the, there's the other small issue that uh, on the, uh, for the uh, public facing API, we need to be thread safe in the compiler. We, we need to be fast and not thread safe because it's single threaded. So, so there are obvious differences here. So what we do instead is we put a cleaned up facade on top of this whole thing, which is called reflect uh, API universe. And that's essentially, uh, uh, there's an object that implements it, which is called reflect.mirror. Um, so here's the here's the the roughly the thing of the, how we make this facade. So we have our trait types, and it's part of a universe. And then we have a, uh, a class called apps type, abstract type, which gives you the cleaned up inter uh, uh, interface of a type. So that's essentially what we want to expose to the reflection framework. So it contains things like type symbol, declaration that gives you the member, uh, sorry, no, that gives you the thing that's declared in the type, member gives you the member of the type, all members we have seen, is subtype we have seen, base type. So all the implementations of these methods that we have seen initially are in the facade. And then we say here in this uh, trait types, we say, well, it will have a type type, and that type will be a subtype of apps type. But we don't say what that type is. It's just an abstract type. Now, in the actual implementation of the reflect internal universe, that's the thing that we hide from you, there is a concrete implementation of that type that actually does the thing. But here, it's just abstract. And we just say, well, there is a type that has this interface. And you can refer to it. And you can call all these members. But you can't call the others, because they are hidden from this type abstraction. Uh, so that's a very powerful way to actually package up things to do encapsulation, information hiding, which is much more powerful than standard interfaces. The fact that you can have abstract types is very powerful. So why can't we do the, whole th the same thing with interfaces? So with interfaces, the problem would be, let's say we have this less than method that takes another argument, the type, the, uh, the other type. right? Let's say uh, we don't want to do that. So if we, ex if we mention that this thing is a type, we have to tell you what it is, because it's part of the interface. So type leaks. So we can't tell you what it is. We could maybe say that has a type apps type. right? But that means that the less than method then could only use the cleaned up interfaces of the apps type. And it probably wants to know much more internally. So it can't do that either. And we can't re-implement it with a type, because if we override a method, well, it must, have, must be exactly the same type. It can't be something that's stricter than the other thing. So that shows that with uh, the standard way of just interfaces, you don't actually get this information hiding if there are flows from one method to the next via the types. Then you really need the full power of these abstract types. OK, so here's the implementation. Uh, that's the reflect internal package. Uh, so here you have the trait types. Uh, uh, and here's the concrete class type that would slot in. So that's like an abstract definition. That's a concrete definition that tells you what it is. It extends apps type, of course, and it contains the full implementation of the interface. But it would also contain many more, implement many more methods. So interfaces are not enough. So in the conclusion, uh, what I wanted to show you here a little bit is what you can do with Scala in terms of composition and abstraction. It's actually a very powerful, and, but I believe also very regular language when it comes to position, composition, because it has a couple of simple principles. First is everything can be nested, classes, methods, object types. You can nest them all inside each other. Second one principle is everything can be abstract. A method can be abstract, but so can be a value or a type. And third is that the type of this can be declared freely, and that can express dependencies. And finally, uh, that thing together gives us a great software architecture that allows us to attack problems that were previously unsolvable. Because I believe, really, to 
give a rich reflection interface to a language was an unsolved problem. I don't know any other language that has that. And here the, the composition principles made that problem solvable by being able to really extract the key parts and make them both reusable in two instances, reflection and compiler, but also be able to abstract over that so that we can hide uh, the parts that are not, not important for the user. Okay, uh, I think I probably need to skip this thing and uh, go right to questions. Okay, so there was a recent blog post by David Pollack where he uh, claims that the major uh, obstacle to scale adoption in industry is the binary compatibility between different versions. So there was this process called fresh Scala. The idea was to simultaneously build all the libraries and testing frameworks with each new release and uh, that uh, was not implemented yet. So I wonder what are your opinions and what are the plans to uh, automate this process? Yeah, so, so, so he's, he's absolutely right. So what we hear, uh, we've, we've asked a lot of people in the industry that use Scala uh, uh, and, peop and, and also people that do not use Scala for various reasons, where essentially what are your main pain points? And uh, we got number one, always IDE immaturity. So that's what we have worked on intensely. And number two, binary compatibility. So what are we gonna do about binary compatibility? Uh, the first thing is uh, really what David proposes, he ran into an open door because that's precisely the thing that we have started doing. Uh, the uh, uh, Josh Sureth, uh, who essentially started Fresh Scala, or well, David started Fresh Scala, but Josh Sureth essentially was volunteered to do it. He didn't have time then. Now he's part of TypeSafe. That's precisely what he will do. So, so there will be a, it's called community build, uh, a set of blessed libraries uh, that uh, where the idea is the, if somebody wants to contribute that library, it will be built nightly with the nightly builds. So that means it will come out at the same time as any new Scala release. Uh, you can then package the, get, get all these libraries in a single package. The other thing that does for us, because I think to the libraries, there are really two problems. It's not just binary compatibility. It's also the fact that some of the libraries get pushed out with uh, great uh, anti anticipation and enthusiasm, but then they sort of whittle away and people lose interest and they're not maintained. And then if you bet your system on that library, then you've lost. So one other part of this community build will be, well, those are libraries that are guaranteed to be maintained. So if somebody wants to use that library, they must guarantee uh, a level of commitment to actually maintaining that library. If you want to propose further libraries to do that and, ha and, and are committed to maintaining that, then uh, send mail to Josh Sureth uh, and uh, uh, we, I'm, I'm sure we, we, we would love to hear from you and, and work with you on that. So that's, that's the, the, the short-term version. There are some other uh, aspects to that. One is that TypeSafe will guarantee stable builds, so you don't have to change as often. Uh, the third part is that we already uh, uh, guarantee binary compatibility of at least minor versions. So 2.9.1 was binary compatible to 2.9. And we actually check verified that with a tool. We've open sourced that tool, so now other libraries can do the same thing, that if they actually push out a new library, then that library, they can verify that the library is binary compatible. Uh, one thing that's sometimes a bit overlooked is that it's as much a library problem than a compiler problem because a library risks being binary incompatible if, let's say, you add new things to a trait and then implementers of that trait uh, become, become can't, can't, can't really work anymore. Uh, the, uh, that, that's things that you can't do in Java. It would be illegal. The compiler would, uh, would, would uh, you ha you'd have to rewrite your implementations. Scala is sort of one step ahead and says, well, okay, you can actually add new methods to a trait as long as they have implementations. Uh, everything will work as it did before. Only you need to recompile. But the problem is that since it's now so convenient to actually add stuff to a trait, which in Java you can't do, people actually do it and break binary compatibility. Uh, the alternative is not necessarily better. So for instance, if I take Eclipse, Eclipse has a couple of interfaces that are numbered through. So interface one, interface two, interface three, interface four, and so on. And that was every time they added something to the old interface. 
And then for a client of the interface, it's a nightmare because you don't know what you have. You say, well, if it's the new version, then I can, can call this. If it's the old version, I have to do something else. So you have a, a lot of spaghetti code if instance of, instance of, instance of. In, in Java, it's the only way to do it because you can't actually add two interfaces in, in the current Java. In Java 8, uh, there looks a thing like virtual extension methods that could solve that, that would ve be very much like the trade methods. And I'm lobbying uh, with uh, the uh, Brian Gertz and the, the, the Java team to actually make that general enough that we can implement trades that way, and that would solve a lot of the binary compatibility problems. I'm not there yet, so if you can help me uh, have a good, good direct uh, line to, to Brian or something like that, lobby them that, that they do that. Hi. Um, I use IntelliJ, and I, it sounds like you're doing a lot of work on the uh, Eclipse uh, side of things. Is there going to be that work that you're doing? Is that the will IntelliJ be able to take advantage of some of that work for, of the compiler, or will I be using Eclipse a year from now? Yeah. So, so we 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 concentrated on Eclipse because IntelliJ is in pretty good hands already. So we don't want to compete with those guys. And and Eclipse was in dire straits. So we we felt that Eclipse was the one more in need, which is not a value judgment at all that we say you should be using Eclipse and not IntelliJ. We're very, very happy that JetBrains and outside contributors do such a good job with IntelliJ. Can IntelliJ use the Eclipse uh, or what we do with the presentation compiler? In principle, they could, uh, yeah. So IntelliJ's model is a bit different that they use the IntelliJ data structures, the IntelliJ tree that's shared between all languages. And that's why they get the whole, the, the fantastic refactorings for free. Essentially, you can import them immediately. And you get this pasting from Java to Scala and back. So that's really a cute tri trick what they can do. What, where they suffer a little bit is then in the supporting compiler, they had to write their own, which we, I personally was, was found it great that they did that because it was really fantastic to get some sanity check whether our spec and our compiler match. So in the early days of the IntelliJ plugin, I always got that thing, uh, mails that said, well, the spec says this, the compiler says that. Explain, please. And it was most, most of the time <laughs> it was a bug in the compiler, or more likely the spec, actually, that the spec just, just didn't, didn't do things correctly. So this was immensely, immensely helpful uh, to do that. Um, but now, um, can they use the presentation compiler? I believe they could, uh, but it would mean essentially having two parallel trees. So essentially to have their own trees and then to just generate the Scala trees on the side. I mean, presentation compiler runs in its own thread anyway. And th then to just essentially get the information in and out indexed by position to say, to type check a, a tree on the IntelliJ side, they would say, well, that's the position, start point, end point, hand that over to the, to the presentation compiler, get the type out of it and continue. So it's possible and maybe, maybe it will be there. I think it would, I mean, it would increase the memory footprint, but I think it would, would certainly increase the, the error highlighting in, in IntelliJ, yeah. Uh, <coughs> Last year, at least uh, two new uh, uh, JVM-based uh, language appears. Uh, they uh, sail on from JBoss, Kotlin from IntelliJ, and both of them seems uh, borrowed a lot of uh, Scala, I mean, st uh, syntax and mm -hmm. organization. What you can uh, tell about them? What are your opinion about the well, project? I, 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 I think that's very, very good. So it shows that, uh, I, I, I mean, we have, we have borrowed a lot of things from other languages. So if other languages now borrow things from Scala, that's, that's, that's altogether a very good thing. And it shows, well, first we did something that obviously is attractive and worthwhile. And uh, uh, generally, I think that having language experimentation and new languages on the JVM is a very good thing. So I, there, there are some really silly language wars that start and uh, people say, well, why do you design a new language, says Scala, and things like that, and I think that's just silly. So to give you one story, when, when I was, um, um, when Java came out in 95, I was very attracted by Java. Uh, that was even when it was in alpha. So I set out to write a Java compiler because that should be the basis of, uh, writing then uh, uh, our extended language compilers, pizza, and things like that. And a colleague of me, mine said, well, why do you write a Java compiler? There is already one. Well, that compiler then became Java C in the end and, uh, and, and things like that. So it shows that, uh, that often people say, well, why do you do this new stuff? There's already the incumbent. But 
I think, well, who knows? I mean, uh, it, it, it might be something great that happens there. So I, th I think absolutely innovation is good. Experimentation is good. Oh, my opinion about, about these languages. So um, I haven't seen that much yet. Uh, so uh, before we can, so, so I, I, I've seen some of the initial presentations where uh, the, the problem is you can't really judge before it's out. Uh, there, often you say, well, we want to do things this way, and then there's a reality check that you say, well, Scala has also evolved. So in, in some of the, of the things that we pushed out in Scala, we believed, well, this is very elegant, this is the right way, and then we found, no, actually, there are lots of traps that programmers fall into, so we had to change it. So I think um, we, we need to judge them when they're out. It's too early to, 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 to decide now. Uh, of the two languages, it seems like Kotlin goes more in the Scala direction in terms of syntax and Ceylon, but all that is pretty su superficial to judge a language by its syntax. So, so we have to see when they're out and then see, see, see how they're doing. <laughs>